can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I took the cell on this doji. Overall, uh, there was a very big bearish force here, and the doji attempted the 62 but didn't. Um, so for this one, I risked about 3%. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the entry point, please? Right here, to short. All right. Um, yeah, I risked about 3, or, uh, yeah, about 3% uh, to the high just above this supply zone here in case they wanted to just jump it and then drop it. So in the end, it just shot up. It took me out, um, and it kind of came back down a little bit, so I bought in. And then sold it, uh, saying about right here. Mm -hmm. um, and then it came up to here. I knew it was very overextended, so I sold more on this consolidation zone here. OK. Um, so I got in to sell here, and it came down, kind of started consolidating here at this zone, so I closed. OK. Um, and then I uh, took a long, actually. I closed and went long. And then, yeah, it was based on the level of demand. Then as price kind of broke down, I just held, didn't close the uh, the long position and ended up closing down here or adding in down here once it hit this major demand. Uh, so it consolidated, came up to here, I sold here. Um, and then as it came back down to here, I bought in more. I, I uh, When I sold here, I sold about a third of the position in total from that buy back here. So it was entry one here, entry two here, and then sell one third here. Okay. Uh, came down to here. I bought back in with one third. And then it came down to this guy. Uh, so I closed it, took a short. This dropped. I closed it at the bottom of this. Uh, and yeah, I just kind of stopped trading it because it started slowing down and consolidating more so. Waiting for it to find a deeper demand to go back in long for the longer term. Okay. Uh, so were you... Up or down? Um, so starting about here, when this initially stopped me out, I was at minus 13. Uh, then for this guy uh, to go long and then sell, I made about uh, eight, five. Made about five bucks. And then um, the sell here made about three. And then I took the long here. That rallied all the way down to this. So this trade continued running until over here. So I added in again and then closed here. Uh, this one totaled about 10, so another five. That's five. And then um, I bought back in here, closed and sold everything here. So this is 30. Uh, roughly like minus 35 
And then this cell, it closed out about $4. So $4 to ten thirteen so those are cancelled so I netted minus thirty one uh dollars yep okay uh, um let's before I uh say what I have to say based on what I can see if you can do things again, what would you have done differently, Jared? Um, the cell position that I got there, I would have uh, taken it and held it longer. Okay, what um, Because, yeah, overall there was no real good demand in this section. And then to turn around and be a buyer after there's no real good demand in this section kind of goes against my intuition. So follow the intuition. Um, and then once this demand breaks, this whole buy trade is now kind of invalid based on the demand. So just overall close it on this bearish candle. And then maybe even sell from there until it finds a really good demand like it did. Kind of, yeah, that lack of fluidity cost me about 30 bucks. Okay, so what cost do you think that lack of fluidity? Um, kind of hope and um, yeah, it's like there is such a forceful bullish candle here that you know, they're going to find a demand here. They're going to find a demand here. So by closing it and selling, I'm at that demand they're going to find. So I didn't want to. And it ended up, uh, yeah, I was kind of catching a falling knife and hoping kind of at the same time. Okay. Um, so next time that this happens again, what will you do? Mm, close, close here. If I'm long from the demand, once the demand breaks, you gotta close. I mean, okay. as long as it's uh, yeah, based upon the demand. So if the trade's based upon, based upon a demand or supply zone, close it once the supplier demand breaks in are uh, out of your favor okay uh, when you're trading mm -hmm. which methodology do you use the most um usually uh, m1s m1s mm -hmm. uh, do you use when you use m1s do you use the moving averages in your chart when you're trading m1s um, no, okay, no, I have uh, this guy set up for that. Gotcha. Yeah, that's way easier. That's way better. Yeah, for that add in um, that I did on this section, right here though, I, I switched and did the uh, the M3 after I you know, was buying in based on the demand. It found an M3 to go long and this closed like that. I added in at the close of that candle. So that last five pip uh, entry was based on M3. Oh, but there wasn't, right? Um, yeah, right here is M3 to go long. And then price came back down to wholesale. Exactly. So, so once that happened, that's when I closed and took that short to make that five. Closed everything, went short. Got it. Yeah. So now if you're using M1 and you see this as a point of entry, because what does this signify? This kind of uncertainty. Sellers are starting to take over. And what type of doji is it? Gravestone. Exactly. 
because it, well also at the end of the day because everything looks in hindsight mm -hmm. at the end of the day you, you have also a very bullish candle over there mm -hmm. so once it had a form of stability at the area of demand right there you have a lower low right there and then higher low over here but you have higher low from there higher low still from there higher low from there this is way stronger so technically yeah you have a buying over there nothing dictating on on this side because it could easily head up over there though mm -hmm. so but this is also facing 15 minutes this is your exit from this buy because you have a gravestone doji and then you have a bearish candle that created a an evening star yeah um so sell sell and the stochastic on it was like 61. yeah so simply that's uh excuse me if you're just basing it on method one see it's struggling also from this this is mm -hmm. however this hole is part of this so that's that's the question the question is why did they push it all the way up there and why did they give it back so they're also going to be determined from a bigger time frame to see what they're really doing so what does uh the daily time frame show jared uh, bullish candle from demand yeah uh, kind of losing steam though with the long upper wick but they're willing to surpass all these highs so that's yeah, last week bonus giving thing <laughs> So if it finish above the eight or the ten, then by Sunday you have an opportunity to go long short term. But the thing is, they don't like the lower low over here. Mm -hmm. So simply, what's the weekly showing there? Um, bearish with consolidation. Yeah, it's a bearish with consolidation right there. So in my opinion, I think the slowdown stabilize itself to correct itself before a continuation that's from what i can just see right at this point in time so look at it okay. would we still want to hold off on buying um if we're oh yeah i'm still wanted. buying at this point because we're you're still in the area of demand to be honest it has to correct itself to 132 ish around there on a bigger time scale before you can continue because it's way oversold on a mm -hmm. bigger, bigger bigger time frame yeah things are not sustainable when everything's oversold or it's not sustainable either when something's overbought right yeah it has to come back down before they and create demand once again before it can continue to go up and in this particular case you know uh, it has to create more demand to create over uh overbought conditions to create supply in order for the price to continue to drop mm -hmm. you know when something's falling it has to be supported at one point yeah so on a short term buy at demand from a four hour perspective, we're at one right now. Mm -hmm. Next one's here. So, Amazing. Exactly. So notice all those higher highs. Mm -hmm. Lower low. So now you have a bunch of lower lows, then all of a sudden you have a bunch of higher highs. See how it's diverging yeah. opposite sides so then somewhere here it has to create a higher low somewhere and then to continue 
either to break the 131 error to create a new higher high somewhere, but it, it has to correct itself on a bigger grand scale, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So short, even shorter term than sell until it finds that uh, higher low? Uh, no. Uh, shorter, I'm um, right at this point in time, it's good to buy, in my opinion. I'm not, uh, I won't be a seller. Okay. Yeah, to, uh, if, if we were in on this and saw this, would that be a okay one to sell? Uh, sorry, Jared, I, I didn't see it. Uh, um, can you see it? Yeah. Uh, this one right here? Mm -hmm. Because uh, they pushed it up and weren't able to break through the supply, would this one be an okay to sell on or just too bullish? It's too bullish. I, I believe that uh, because it, it tested the first time it came back, second time, third time, notice that it kept increasing its price. Mm -hmm. And finally break out to the fourth time. Yeah, and then you come back, it's now a level of demand. I believe it's gonna break through this easy. So if you sell, um, I mean, there's a possibility that you could, that it could drop. The probability of it continuing that is higher than dropping, in my opinion. You have a higher chance of winning through buying right here. Got it. Can I be a seller? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So I believe from what I what I can see is uh, the micromanagement once again, and mm -hmm. panicking to a certain degree, to a certain mode uh, on shorter term. And then not panicking when I need to. Exactly. Right. So. How can you control once again that emotion when when that happens? That's a that's a challenge right there. Yeah, I need to get better at uh, cutting losses uh, when they're yeah when they're losing, and then uh, letting the winners ride or the ones that have some type of a setup yeah. that show the. Yeah, the bank's back, it let it ride. Exactly. Yeah, if I just held that short all the way, you know, up at wherever I got it up here, I would have made everything I lost back and then some mm -hmm. by just executing two trades for the day instead of executing eight. <laughs> Maybe yeah. over trading too. Over trading, yes, that could be. Uh... Also a possibility. Uh, and as well, if you notice, um, <coughs> maybe perhaps so we could do that right now. I'll give you time. Have a have a quick look. Have a quick look in terms of if you look at your profits <coughs> versus losses. Look at the time frame of what you use with your profitable trades versus your losses. So I'll give you a... Um, I could tell you, I, I look at it quite often. It's uh, my bigger losses have come from bigger term time frames that weren't properly uh, risked and weren't properly... Um, yeah, I mean, my uh, my position sizing was too great for the amount of risk that the trade was. Probability was fairly low, and I over leveraged. Okay. Um, on a smaller time frame, though, uh, as far as quantity of losses, I think there's more of them on the, the like 15 minute and less. Mm-hmm. And usually on days that I do that, I have the same pattern where I overtrade and uh, hold on to things I shouldn't hold on to. Okay. Um, but they're more like uh, $10, $15, $20. And then the big ones on the larger time frames are like $50, $60.
but it takes them a lot longer, like maybe two days of waiting, five days of waiting. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they, they shouldn't be that high. That, you know, when they lose, it should only be like minus 15 or minus 10. And then when the shorter term time frames want time frames lose, it should be like five, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Five or ten. Okay. So uh so if you look at low probability on bigger time frames, you have a low probability where precision size you said is greater. Or position. Um, position times stop loss, yeah, is greater. Yeah. Based on stop loss with a low probability, then there's no go, right? When low probability should also be smaller precision size, higher probability, mm -hmm. then bigger precision size, which makes more, more uh, sustainable. Mm -hmm. Now, if your time frame is small time frames, um, because you, you know, part of your plan is simply that you can look into what you have control based on that. Um, here on a bigger time frame, you definitely need to be patient, right? You need a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. So if you're impatient, then smaller time frames makes more sense because you can control based on that time frame. You can go in and out, in and out. Here you're waiting. So it's a waiting game, basically. It's like jujitsu. It's a mm -hmm. waiting game. You wait until the person moves. You can't just keep attacking, attacking, because if you keep attacking, attacking where you have advantage, then you know you might give up to a position. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but if you're on the bottom and you're being smashed, and time is against you, then you know. You, you, I mean, you can stay there just to relax a little bit. But if you're being smashed and if they move, then boom, then you have to keep on moving and moving to get out of that, to get out of the trouble, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm not doing that. I'm getting smashed and staying there. <laughs> exactly. If you're getting smashed and staying there, eventually you're gonna you're gonna tap. Mm -hmm. In with this, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have a low probability because you're getting smashed, you need to find a way to get out. So yeah, it is uh so training is like martial arts for me without physical contact that's all mm -hmm. that's actually that video was uh was pretty cool because it, it says a lot um rather than chasing for the money you have to work work on the process mm -hmm. the journey behind it right yeah and, uh, and he says it very well and how to how do you adapt to to that situation? And one guy said, you know, well, you know, in jujitsu, you have a problem, you address that problem, one problem at a time. Mm -hmm. It's not like addressing everything. And if you cannot address it, and he says, guess what? Then let go of it, because it doesn't work. So based on last week, you addressed a problem, and you create a solution for it to create certain rules for yourself. And then I asked you to email me, however, I never received that email, right? So unless, did you write your rules down on what you have to do for this week? Um, I only wrote a couple down. Did you follow those rules? I didn't follow one of them. Got it. So that's then there you go again. Then we have to we need to address. So to address, did I follow the rules?
you did not why so what was what caused in order for you not to follow one of those rules so firstly let's identify what was the rule what were um, the rule was uh, to cut a trade if it's not within uh you know why it took it okay not within its being so uh yeah as that one started falling it found that really weak demand and i bought in and then once it broke the demand i'm supposed to close i didn't okay uh, why didn't i do it because uh i guess i was kind of flustered with the first loss that i didn't want to have a second loss but yeah i guess to set up a, a recipe for success you need to you know execute a high probability trade not a a low probability and hope it pays out. Mm. So, uh, have you met uh, Michael? Michael, they call him the Hobbit. Um, what's his last name? Oh, oh man. I, I, or he's he's at a uh, Half Gracie, right? Yeah, he was a Half Gracie student, and then uh, he trained with Gumby. Oh uh, yeah, I've. Small deal. Yeah. yeah, I think. Yeah, he's short and like stocky, right? Short, bit muscly, and yeah, like you know. Yeah, I've, I've seen him. I think I've met him once. Yeah. So he he um he taught the class yesterday at lunchtime, and he was showing some kimuras um, from a uh, standard kimura to a one-handed Kimura and he calls it the fugitive technique um, because if you one-handed the way how he showed it it's, it's some for some reason your triceps like you lose power it doesn't matter how big the person is you can't move it it's uh yeah it's, it's amazing it's like the kryptonite right yeah, Superman's so strong, and then boom, you have the kryptonite, and it weakens you. And it's, and he was showing the technique like, holy moly. But he was saying, um, he said, hey, bro, um, I don't give a left, man. I, um, like, if I know that I get trapped into a kimura or armbar or whatnot, before even I feel it, I got to tap. Because in the past, I've been known he, like you said, he's been known for uh, like a dangerous person to train with because people don't tap. And so in his mind, he said, in order for me for me to work, I, I'm going to I'm going to yank it to see how far it can go, where it would work if you don't tap. Hey, man, it's not my problem. That's basically his thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> so, but he's saying and then all of a sudden people say, what the fuck, man? I said, what was that all about? I said, what do you mean, what the fuck, bro? Is like, you know, you didn't tap. <laughs> I said, yeah. If you don't, if you don't tap, I said, is it my problem? I said, it's your effing problem, man. That's a, that's that's on you. It's like you, what? Because you're, you, well, you feel like you're a man or something that you don't have to tap. I said, that's the reason why you got to tap in order to you know up to where your your threshold is going to be. So, but anyway, he was explaining about tapping and he's telling the white belts that even before, even if you're very flexible, but even before you can even feel the pain, you got to tap because he said, you don't, you just don't know. And the next thing you know, it'll take time to heal. You're not going to come to training. You don't have a training partner, then you're screwed. So uh, he said, this is not a competition and competition is a different story. He said, but when you're training, uh, train, train because you wanna you wanna get better. He said, "Don't just uh, what did he what did he say? Like, uh, don't be like uh, like very ego or whatnot. You know, just you know, you're like you're a hero. There you go. Don't be don't be a hero by not you tapping. That's what he said. And so." And I said to myself, wow, how can we relate that to, to trading? Same thing. Is it because we don't like losing? So it's almost like you're getting kimurred and then 
when you're losing, even before the lose the loss becomes bigger, you just have to tap, right? Yeah. You just know when. Uh, but it's also the timing on when to get out and when to get in. So just because sometimes trying to a demand doesn't necessarily um sorry Ray, you kinda cut out. Um so it's also the timing of when to get out. In other words, don't get out at the level of demand, right? Wait until the price comes back to the level of supply again and then get out. So that's uh I found myself sometimes when the timing is saying it's, you know, ready to break to the downside, I think like that and then you know, I'll hold on, wait for it to come back up to supply and it just breaches the level of demand and goes even deeper. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then that's when I'm like, well, crap, now I'm even deeper at a level of demand. I can't close it. I need to close it at supply. And then by the time it comes back up, you know, if I didn't micromanage, I'm still you know, probably losing the same, if not a little more than if I had just closed it once it did its first little deal, you know? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's another thing I've been wrestling with. Not really, uh, um, when I don't set that hard stop, the price, you know, can trample it. And by the time I find it, it's too late. And then it's already at that demand. And then I don't want to close it, so I hold it longer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it corrects, comes back up, and then immediately, once it hits that supply, yep, I'm out. But when it doesn't want to and it just keeps dropping because, uh, you know, lack of MTFA or something like that, yeah, I kind of run into a problem with that. So, yeah, maybe be more meticulous with it too. Got it. There you go. Um... It is a uh, meticulousness once again. Very nice. So, so Ray, I have a quick question about that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're seeing, you know, one level of demand, say you're working, like your goal is maybe to achieve 15 pips. Yes. And your uh, stop loss is going to be at, uh, you know, five pips down. But then you notice there's also a level of demand 15 pips away yeah um do you set your stop at the five pip stop once it gets taken and it drops to maybe that next level add back in or do you set it to just that level at the bottom i always put the 15 uh, pip stop because i've seen in the past where let's say for example let's take this one Mm -hmm. um, so the, yeah, the lows here. Yeah. <clears throat> it's uh, so from this low, it's two pips. Yes. So, with that example, if I put just the spread, the odds that I'm going to get taken is highly probable. However, uh, and that's the beauty about uh, trading is that. They have to break through this low, this low, this low, this lows, all these lows, right? Um, will be uh, will be tested. Of course, the major low is this, but once you have that lower low, and someone was willing to go below that previous low, somewhere, sometime they either they will retest to come back to create a higher low or it will break to create a lower low. So when this happens on the other end, that lower low, these highs, they're also in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's people adding extra money in when it's more expensive. Yeah, so it's just a matter of, if a low has been formed, will these highs be compromised? If the highs, won't be broken, then you have a lower high, then definitely a continuation of the trend to go to create new lower lows is highly probable. I say probable because I don't know whether if they will break that 
you ask low. As far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned, they will create a new higher low. But if those highs have been compromised, then easy, then that is a ooh, well, deja vu. So when that happens, then for me, this is a good, um, a good sign that a higher low will be formed somewhere sometime in the future because it doesn't make any sense. If someone was willing to bid higher compared to the previous highs, then that's a, that's a good sign where someone knows something that nobody knows. Mm -hmm. It's like buying a house. Why would you make an offer at an auction above $1.31 million if it was below $1.31 million in the past. That's basically, set, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure if that happens, right? If you don't have a piece of information and then you're beating on top of that, then if the, if the price keeps dropping, then you're screwed in terms of value. Unless you really love that house, then you know that somewhere sometime in the future, it's going to be worth 1.3125 or 1.32 million dollars somewhere sometime in the future. Other than that, if it's not worth the value above the last high point, then why would you even bother placing a, a higher bid, if, if that makes sense? Yeah, it does. Because in the past, someone was willing to go below that low, so the seller was willing to sell below the market price in terms of the last loads. So whoever got in at 1.31 here, 1.7, in terms of institutional price point, and then another institution was willing to sell it, this guy who bought it at 1.3017 really took it as a bargain and said, ha ah, sucker. Like, yeah. And now, do you think a person who bought it over here won't be selling over there? He'll be selling, he'll be, he's probably potting at this point in time. If, yeah. if you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if he's buying millions of contracts, I mean, and you, and you sell it, that's a lot of money for one, how many days? Right? Basically one day, one two yeah. days in a day. Yeah, half a day. Right? So now that if someone was also willing to go beyond that, and for me, that is definitely a good sign that the valuation of the dollar against the CAD will be worth more somewhere sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. So when there's now new higher highs and there are a bunch of lower lows, then a higher low will be formed. So imagine if I put my stop at this low, then I would have stopped that and now it's going up. So the reason why I put minus 15 is just a form of just insurance. But just in case no one was willing to go beyond that and it, it rebounds to the upside, what is it going to do with those highs? And at least it gives me time that it will come back and correct itself and it doesn't want to form a higher high or a lower high, then I have a better price of selling where it will reduce my risk compared to getting stopped out over here where it's not necessary. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. And then that's where we can double down when it creates that higher low because it is confirmation that, hey, we have a higher high, then we have a good confirmation of a higher low, then the next move of bigger players where either we'll create a new higher high or if it's going to be compromised, create a lower high, then at least when you're buying at the demand and you can see a lower high, then you sell some. 80% mm -hmm. of it. Then it comes back down, create a higher loan, and buy back in again. Right? So that's uh, where by looking not just okay here, but the, what are the things that we really need to look for? The highs and lows are very important. Is it diverging? Is it converging? If it's diverging, yes, then you have a high chance of proper reversal. Do we have to panic? No. Uh, like I said, I'm in this game now for the past probably two to three weeks. 
and um, of course loss goes up and down like a yo-yo. It's just a matter of controlling that emotion. And then mm -hmm. yesterday, no, Thursday, no, today's Thursday, Tuesday, Tuesday night. So one of the white belts asked, like, you know, how do you deal with the mirror? And I said, what do you mean? He said, I just deal with it. He uh, said, well, it's too big. He said, yeah, absolutely. So the question is, what are you going to do if you're going to stay flat? Of course, you're, you're going to suffer down there. But if you keep moving, you need to find a way, then you're not going to suffer. So like, likewise with Eric. Like, Eric is around maybe 220 or maybe 200 but he feels like a 250 300 pounds when he's on top of you because he knows his weight distribution and when that happens at one point you're like you can't breathe and this is where it tests your mental ability you know can you control who people are anxious because you can tell when people have anxiety they can't hack it on the bottom they panic and they'll just keep jerking right until they get tired mm -hmm. sometimes i love it because you know, like what is this guy gonna do how can he control his emotion how can you control that anxiety well I'll just bloody hold him down right and make him suffer down there a little bit mm -hmm. and then it's almost like you see the person like oh fuck, they panic then they tap is, there, is it necessary to tap? No, it's not necessary to tap. So the ability of the beauty about jiu-jitsu is that it gives you, um, it makes you learn how to control that emotion, whatever you're feeling. And hence is why if half was around, if you will, don't tap, don't you bloody tap, don't you effing tap, like, you know, hang in there. So that's, uh, that's jiu-jitsu because it was made for smaller guys to control, like how can you protect yourself from bigger people? And mm -hmm. so that one minute that felt like one hour, at one point, like I'm gonna freaking tap. And then one brain says, don't you bloody tap, just breathe and just hang in there. Now, I don't care if the person is 300 pounds or so who I like the mirror, I said, I don't care if he's on top. I know how to control my breath, I know how to control my emotion. I'm not panicking. I'm not on the fear based. He moves, mm -hmm. then thank you very much. I, I will now move. Even with chokes, before, like, you know, you, people will panic, right? You put the hand in, someone puts a hand on your neck. What's the normal reaction? They will panic, like, oh, the, the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. They're fear based. So when you're training, like, you need to be aware of your fear. Like, what is the fear, right? At this point in time, fear of losing. Fear of losing what? Fear of losing money. Okay, well, if you're fear of losing money, then did you accept that if you're going to to be on the opposite side, how much you're willing to risk? Are you accepting that amount of risk? It's like you being on the bottom and the bigger guys on top of you. You know that the person is definitely like, I mean, reality. Doesn't matter how big they are, they will overpower you. Mm -hmm. Once they overpower you, you just have to be real that, hey, look, I am going to accept that this guy is going to be be on top. I'm going to be on the bottom, but even watch out. But once we be on top, though, I'm going to control the position as much as I can. And I'm not going to fight it either because if he uses muscle, guess what? I will go with it. So same thing in this position. This guy, you have a lot of power over there. But these little mini smaller ones, so the smaller ones, is just a little annoying little dude or a bigger dude who's annoying you <laughs> simply like trying to like irritate you a little bit. There's a question, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna tap out? That's simply the same model, right? The way how uh, the mental game simply from a trading perspective compared to a martial art like jujitsu. See, like this, all of this is just a little annoyance based on this one movement. Mm -hmm. This is all fear-based, what people are basically, or not people, or perhaps institutions or whoever it is out there that's creating the fear to retailers, like, ha, 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 it is dropping. So what do they, what do they want you to do? So. Sell. 
And what do you think they're doing? They're buying Selling. Back. Oh, the banks are, yeah. Yeah, right? Because once that fear base has been created and they're, they're panicking, oh, so, oh, craps, I bought it over here. I better sell now. That's what they want you to do. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, because they know either the person made a mistake or they traded based on impulse. How many times that based on marketing research that people buy based on impulsiveness? True? Mm -hmm. There's a trend. Everybody wants to go within that trend. Yep. Everything's cheap. People will go buy it. Right? So it, it is just part of human behavior. And now that impulsion, that's why the impulsion correction, once there's an impulse, impulsiveness, once there's an impulse of movement, the price kind of go in straight line. They have to correct itself to a certain degree, to a certain point. And part of this correction is creating fear-based where it has to also create more demand from a supply perspective. Just the law of supply and demand, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if your trading game, on the other hand, of course, then think like a, an institution. It's not sustainable, so you have to sell. Or can it drop down to major demand? But you need patience. Impulsion correction impulsion but this is just the whole impulse based on this one movement because it's news based no news mm -hmm. so how the mid sense yeah. there jerry yeah it does yeah i just now have to implement it yeah and that is uh the challenging part um sometimes the awareness when we're not aware of things we do <laughs> What's the word? Dumb shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And, you know, part of my learning, I mean, the same thing. Sometimes if I'm not aware and I get impulsive, I'm like, you idiot. Look what you just did. <laughs> right. So, yeah, that's uh, it's a normal thing for everybody. Just part of human behavior. Yeah. Cool. Thank welcome. you. You're welcome. Okay, then uh, let's wrap this one up and we'll go through, have a look up uh, opportunities, okay? Sounds good. Before we do, let's just summarize what you learned then. What did you learn? Um, to follow, make sure to follow the rules. Okay, what else? Uh, to uh, maintain meticulousness. Uh, maintain uh, like a psychology uh, to the point where you, uh, I guess not maintain a psychology, but like maintain a, uh, a realistic perspective on the market like you were saying about the sustainability uh, don't be a buyer when it's not sustainable to keep going up and don't be a seller when it's not sustainable to keep going down earnings uh, yeah everything else is just uh Stuff to work on. Nice. Very good. Excellent. All right, Jared. We'll see you in a minute. Sounds good. Thanks, Ray. You're welcome.